Yeah, this is Lauren here, and I'm just delighted that I'm sitting here at the Earthrise Retreat Center in Petaluma, California, with my great creative friend Phil Cousineau. So welcome, Phil. Nice to be back with you again. Yeah, I'm delighted. I'm <laughs> delighted. Uh, Phil was with us in May, as you may know, uh, of last year, and it was just such fun and so exciting, and so many wonderful things happened. We just decided that we need to do it again. And so we're really delighted that you're listening in on this webinar to find out more about our program in Chart. Uh, the large umbrella of the program is called Walking a Sacred Path, and we're delighted that Phil is joining us again this May in Search for Meaning in the Labyrinth of Life. And so it's really a, a wonderful way to connect and take a pilgrimage, and we'll be showing you that soon. Just a reminder, because I think many of you know Phil's work. Uh, we have used his wonderful book, The Art of Pilgrimage, uh, many years now in Chart. And that's actually your probably most well-known book. And then your recent wonderful travel book, which I had the pleasure and privilege of endorsing, uh, called The Book of Roads. So that's just recently out, late last year, right? That's right. The yeah. Collected Stories. Uh, how, how travel formed my life from Michigan to Marrakesh. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's really a wonderful book. So and Phil is also a filmmaker, and one of the wonderful things that he does, he's the host of Global Spirit, uh, which is a wonderful uh, program, television program, uh, at cable, right? And on PBS now. On PBS, mm -hmm. wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so one of the exciting things about uh, Phil's teaching with us in Chart is that he shows clips, and I won't say any more until we get there. Um, but I do want to uh, uh, move us along here, is because I, what we'll do today, because we have just a brief half hour, is that we will uh, say a little bit more about Chart and show show you the city. And you're looking at the cathedral, a very famous photo across the wheat fields uh, that you can see about 30 miles off. And here, uh, Chart, uh, the city of Chart. Uh, the medieval village is a place of pilgrimage, and so many people come, and this happens to be a, a large youth day, and pilgrims come and march in and sing and, and all, and they're on their way out from the city. You can see the cathedral behind. This is a little better picture of the cathedral because this is, again, uh, looking at Chartres Cathedral, and this building dates from 1194. It's the fifth uh, cathedral on this site, and of course the site is highest on the hill, as most sacred sites are. And I will say that um, uh, Chartres Cathedral is an active sacred site. Don't you agree, Phil? Things happen there. And that is one of the more sublime definitions of pilgrimage. And so I, I find pilgrimage to be a transformative journey to a sacred site, mm -hmm. a spiritually transformative site. You really can't twist somebody's arm to go on a, on a pilgrimage. There's a call. That's a right. call to the spirit, a call to the soul. And when you arrive, something happens. That's to right. To paraphrase Joseph Heller. Uh -huh. And that's, that's part of the mystery. That's right. That's right. And we always talk about, you know, the inner and the outer and the, the secret. Uh, you, you know you want to go see Shark Cathedral. That's the outer. The inner is, gee, I, it's, I'm, I've just completed a, whatever, a book, a divorce, a, a new job. A, and so that's the inner. And then the secret is... What's the, responding to that call? I think of these as crossroad journeys. Uh -huh. We don't necessarily need to go on a journey like this if we have all the answers at home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when those answers start to fail, the heart cries out, and we look around the world for sacred sites that may hold answers that we can't find at home. That's right. That's right. And Shark Cathedral is the home of the divine feminine. It's, it, it was a, originally the only a religious building, Christian building, named in the name of Mary, Our Lady of Chartres. Uh, and now there's many, but this is in original from the 4th century. So you're looking at this amazing cathedral. Here's a, a view from the river, and I'll show you that in a moment, but this is from the back side of it. And, and right, the building on the left with the, the darker uh, roof, that is where we stay. That is our place of housing there, and literally you're about a 60-second walk from the cathedral. So it's, there it is. That's, that's one of the old uh, 14th century monasteries that's been renovated into guest housing. So here's the river, and you'll, this is a lovely place to walk, a lovely place to reflect, to journal. There's benches along the path. And so this is just another part of chart that's connected deeply to the cathedral. 
uh, Shard Cathedral has the most wonderful uh, and inclusive, uh, extensive collection of 12th and 13th century stained glass windows in the Western world. And this is one of them, Our Lady Belvier, Notre Dame de Belvier, Our Lady of the Beautiful Glass. And this uh, piece, especially the centerpiece, the three main panels in the center, uh, are date back before the Great Fire in 1194. So this has been earlier than what we see in the building now. So Our Lady of the Pillar also, now there's a story, when people are in Chart, we'll have to tell them the story because this now Madonna does not quite look like this anymore. Uh, but here it is, a certain 16th century black Madonna made of pear wood. Uh, and as on a pillar, and if you're there in this small chapel, you'll see especially uh, elderly part uh, people from the village, village to come up and kiss the pillar that she stands on. And then again, Solterre, these are the two black Madonnas. Actually, this is called a dark Madonna because she's much later. The original was destroyed in the French Revolution. And uh, that's one of the things, Phil, I like about the uh, cathedral is that there's so much history. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, that, that you, we can connect to uh, around the French Revolution and the history of the cathedral. Uh, don't forget these great cathedrals were, were called temples of reason after the uh, French Revolution and then reverted back, I think it's in 1811, uh, they reverted back to being churches. So here's a view of the labyrinth from the, uh, the organ loft and again uh, you can see it's placed there. This is a rare view because usually it has chairs on it and uh, of course our privileges of being in the cathedral in the evening, a private evening, that's very different. This is, we do on this uh, May tour and May uh, time of uh, pilgrimage on a roof tour, you can look through, and this is what's called the keyhole, Phil. Isn't that interesting? And so we're about, oh, uh, 100, 115 meters up in the sky and looking down over the cathedral through the keyhole and looking directly onto the labyrinth. So it's a sight to behold. I've heard the phrase bird's eye view. This is a god's eye view. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, this uh, will be on our, our pilgrimage this time. We didn't do that last time. So. Or a goddess's eye view. <laughs> right. Goddess. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. And here's the veil. This veil was the relic. Not the labyrinth, but the veil was the relic that brought thousands and thousands, actually millions of tourists uh, and changed them into pilgrims, uh, starting from the this uh, veil arrived at the cathedral in 876. Yeah, so since then, Chart has been a pilgrimage, a place of pilgrimage. So, and that's on display in the cathedral as well. Now, you you love the light shows, right? Dazzling. <laughs> Dazzling. Uh, one of the things that Chart is doing, I think they are actually one of the first villages uh, to do it. Uh, Amiens is also doing it. There's wonderful light shows on the cathedral. This actually is the north porch. And this captures what it looked like in the Middle Ages. These cathedrals were painted on the outside. Uh, and then when they cleaned this, you know, five, six years ago now, uh, they found the imprint of what paint was there. And so this, then they captured that in a light filter. And then this, isn't it amazing the way they do it? You see the, something similar in Greece uh -huh. when you... Mm -hmm. They have this old image that all of the statues, all of the buildings, including the Parthenon, were a kind of virgin light. Uh -huh. Where in reality, these were open air galleries. Yeah. The world was colorized before the 21st That's century. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It sure was. And not being able to, you know, upkeep it and paint all this again. Mm -hmm. the, the light shows are really a genius to do this. Here's another view of the light show. This is on the front of the cathedral. Uh, again, they are they are sight to behold. And then this is the cathedral labyrinth, and, and this is a famous photo from Jeff Sayward as well. Now, Phil, here we are, the Pilgrim's Journey. Just tell us about this, because this incorporates our course here that you'll be teaching. Back in 1997, I read an astounding piece. For the uh, United Nations had predicted that by the year 2000, travel, the travel industry was going to overcome the armaments industry as the most wow. uh, powerful business in the world. In a way, it was a, a coming, coming into fruition of the Old Testament prophecy of turning swords into plowshares. Mm -hmm. So that 
when I did a little investigation of that, what I discovered was something fascinating that the revival of pilgrimage itself, the road to Santiago de Compostela, which has somewhere between 500,000 and a million people walking it every day, mm -hmm. the pilgrimages to Mecca, to Jerusalem, but also secular pilgrimages, walking in the footsteps of Emily Dickinson mm -hmm. in Amherst or James Joyce in Paris, has produced the phenomenon of more people traveling than any time in the world. So that inspired my book, The Art of Pilgrimage, in, in which I was trying to discover what is happening here. And I found an echo of the hero's journey that I worked on with Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. for many years. Campbell's notion of the hero's journey was it's essentially a search for the self. Mm -hmm. Who am I in this world? Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why I'm here? What am I searching for? And I found those three primal questions are also the engine underneath the pilgrim's journey, with the exception that the pilgrim is looking for a spiritual transformation. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. And so my little model here follows that. It begins with a longing. Um, we're at a crossroads in life. Something is changing in my marriage, in my job, in my living situation. And often there is a call, a call to adventure. Maybe I should go mm -hmm. to a Native American site. Oh, maybe I should go to Europe this year. There's something waiting for me in, in Chart. So I, I love this notion of the hero's journey that's also going counterclockwise, mm -hmm. not clockwise. Because the clockwise journey is boom, 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 the way that life always is. Yeah. It's chronological. But the pilgrim's journey, like all good stories, goes against time. Uh -huh. And that's why time stops uh -huh. at a sacred site. You go and touch the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, or you walk the labyrinth in chart, and time stops. I think mm -hmm. that is a deep longing in the human soul. Mm -hmm. That's why we love stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's why we love museums. Time stops in certain places. And this is why I, I love this notion of a journey. Where could I go that would help me move on to the next stage of my spiritual life? Yeah, yeah, and that is that is the question, and that's what people are asking, because uh, the whole sense of finding meaning. Where do people find meaning? How do we find meaning in our lives? That seems to be the operating question for so many people. I remember when I interviewed Joe Campbell for our film, The Hero's Journey, I asked him exactly this. It's the kind of question you're asked when you get on to your twilight years, right? <laughs> and he um, was bemused by the question, and he thundered at his response. People are always talking about the meaning of life, but what they're looking for is a deep experience of it. Once you've had the deep experience, then you ask, what did it mean? Yeah. So a trip like ours coming up to Sharp provides both. Yes. Mm -hmm. We will be providing people with a magical site, mm -hmm. Sharp itself, the cathedral, the labyrinth. We provide the experience, but also each day what we want to do, right, mm -hmm. is give people the chance for discussion, for practices and exercises to reflect in a way most of us just don't That's when we're right. in the, the grind of everyday life. We want to have these marvelous experiences and then take a moment each day to ask ourselves what people have asked since people were painting on the Paleolithic cave walls mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the south of France. What did it mean? What yeah, did it mean? That's right. And perhaps more now than in other periods because we've, we've really witnessed so much horror in the last few years mm -hmm. that it brings up this question. Mm -hmm. Does life have any meaning? Yeah. Could it possibly have meaning when there is so much arbitrary violence? Yeah. In order to answer that question, I think we have to stop. Mm -hmm. that's Take right. a breath. Go to a special place that is actually safe mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. people, kindred spirits, mm -hmm. that also trust this question. The kindred spirits is so important because you have a community, and many friendships unfold, as we know, from just our time being there in last May. Lifelong friendships. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And uh, one of the things about I really like about our program, it's not based on pack it in, pack it in, pack it in, you know? We have seminars in the morning that Phil will be teaching at. Then we have a small group uh, that's kind of an affinity group. So people feel like they know one another, groups about six or seven people. And then, uh, of course, there's a two-hour lunch in France. <laughs> How can you not do a two-hour lunch in France? Only two hours? <laughs> <laughs> and then in the afternoon, we use it for our, our tours of the cathedral, uh, the tour of the crypt and our time there. And as well, now we are have added, uh, this is very special this time, uh, to do the roof tour. We have, you have to get permission from the French government. And so we, we have that there. So let me move to, you mentioned uh, the creativity wheel. 
Uh, and this, I, I love this. Phil, bring this in because I, I love this. After I came out with the, uh, the, the book on pilgrimage, the, uh, the Art of Pilgrimage, I continued to teach, as I always have, teach writing, creative writing, teach about how to make movies and so on. And then I, I realized as I was doing consultations both with young kids and also people in the Hollywood movie industry, that anybody working on a creative project essentially arrives at the same stuck place if they are going deeper with yeah. their creativity. Mm -hmm. You can continue to repeat yourself mm -hmm. if you choose to do so, and there are reasons to do that. But if you go deeper, if you want to, your work to become more mature, yeah. reflect your creative impulse, you will find yourself in a labyrinth. Oh, that's right. <laughs> as a symbol of anxiety, confusion, um, of a kind of lostness. But there is a way out. There's a great Chinese expression, the darkest part of the forest means you're halfway home. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the labyrinth, it, it has its mirror image as well. It is a journey to the center where your deep spiritual answers will lie. But there is a confusion to get there. There's, there yeah. is anxiety. If you go as I have through the history of creativity, how do people paint, make dances like a Twyla Tharp? How do you make movies? How do you create great poems? Uh, start businesses. You take a journey. Uh -huh. Every yeah. creative project is a journey. Mm -hmm. And that will be one of the four ways that I will like to explore the search for meaning in our time together in Sharp. I want to do follow the kind of the mind, body, soul routine. Mm -hmm. So the first day we will discuss the search for meaning from the spiritual point of view. Mm -hmm. Can you find meaning through your spirituality? Some people can. Others, like my friend Joe said, I found my meaning through reading. My me Alan Watts once asked me, this is Joe Campbell talking, uh, Joe, do you meditate? And he says, yes, I underline yeah, sentences. I, I underline. I, I love that. I love that because that's a, that's a practice. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's it's the, the, uh, the practice of the mind. Not everybody finds their meaning through spirituality. Some people do through the mind. So we'll have a day of the mind, also a day of the body, which we'll explore through notions of pilgrimage, which is a kind of faith in action. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. no longer enough just to go to church or your mm -hmm. therapist's office. You mm -hmm. need to take a long walk somewhere. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. finding meaning through the body is a wonderful yeah. exploration. And the, the fourth one, and the one that w is the one where I live, is finding meaning through creativity. Yeah. Yeah, actually absolutely. making something, making an artifact in the world. Mm -hmm. And to highlight and really make these these four presentations jump up, I want to show clips from our show, yeah. Global Spirit, in which I'm, I've am i been in a privileged position for the last 30 years or so, not only to, pr to be pursuing my creativity and meaning, but having the privilege to, ex to interview some of the greatest minds oh, of our time uh -huh. over the last 30 years. So each of our sessions will have film clips where I interview people like Joseph Campbell, Houston Smith, Jean Shinoda Bolin, mm -hmm. Karen Armstrong, Robert Thurman, uh, Rian Eisler, Stephen Eisenstadt yeah. from Pacifica, yeah. in which we explore exactly this question. And how are you and where? This is an interesting question for me. Uh -huh. Where are you finding meaning? Yeah. Yeah. Because that question is what can propel, uh, give us propulsion for an exploration like the one we will do in Shark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's where, I mean, where in the physical world of Shark, for instance, but also where in your life? What is it that's drawing you, that's calling you, that, that urging, urging you inwardly to write, to put it out in the world, whatever that is? Uh, and I just where I think Shart last time was so effective that it really helped lots of people in their practices. Uh, that you taught writing in the and we took time to for prompts and for people to uh, you know do a ten minute writing session and share it if they want. Uh, but I think that was very effective in really helping people you know start that activity of soul making within their own being. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I'm a great student of Gaston Bachelard, one of the great French philosophers of the 20th century. And he said something that has infused exactly that approach to teaching, in which he says, an experience is not complete until you have put it into your own words. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that helps us from the tendency to become voyeurs, mm -hmm. even in workshops, yeah. in classes in which we sit silent and we just watch. We watch smart people, spiritually inclined people tell us about their experiences, 
but I, that's not enough. I really want to give people a toolkit, so to mm -hmm, speak, mm -hmm. that they can take home practices, exercises every day to keep the trip alive there mm -hmm. and to continue their own journey mm -hmm. on, their, on their way home. Mm -hmm. And we do that with writing exercises, drawing exercises, walking yeah. exercises. Our walking exercises and of course there's a lovely evening in the cathedral with the labyrinth. Uh, and you know this whole sense of soul making involves an activity. And it is, and certainly walking the labyrinth, but also really doing the writing, and like you're saying, make it, put it into your own words, whatever it is. Uh, and so there's a lot of flexibility and freedom around this, uh, and very, very wonderful way of being able to answer that call. And believe me, a lot of people are, are definitely feeling that call. So let me move on here. Uh, and this is actually the labyrinth at the Maison. Uh, we call it the Hotelleria, uh, Maison Saint-Nice. Uh, and so this was one we made a couple years ago. And uh, it's really quite uh, amazing. And this is what we call it the secret garden. So people can't access this labyrinth unless, of course, you're staying there at the Maison. And actually, that's a wonderful metaphor for me. Mm -hmm. You know, the, no, the notion of bricolage, a wonderful French word again. You make art with what's close to you, yeah. within arm's reach of you. You don't have to go to the Sorbonne to make yeah. art. <laughs> so can, right there, the, the labyrinth is made out of the, the tossed away cobblestones that's from right. the village of Chartres itself. I'm, I think that's a wonderful metaphor. Uh -oh. 